Hello everyone, I am Debojit. I am a PhD student in the Department of Physics of Adi Kanpur. I will be taking tutorial sessions of the BTL course named Calculus of One Real Variable. The instructor of this course is Professor Chaudhary Dutt of Adi Kanpur. And in this tutorial sessions, I will be mainly pro doing problem solving. The problems will be taken from the previous assignments of the course. This is our trial video where I will be solving the prerequisite problems which is given as assignment of week 0. So let us begin. So the first problem states that the set in union Q is whether it is countable or uncountable. So So we know that n is the set of natural numbers that is one, two, three, and others, and Q is the set of rational numbers where rational numbers are numbers which can be written in the form p over q where both p and q are integers and q is not equal to 0. Now we know that n is a countable set. Similarly, q is also a countable set. So, as we know, that the union of two countable sets is also countable. So for the question number one, we get that the set in union Q is also countable. So, this is the right answer. We can also look at this problem from another point of view. So, let us quickly do that. We know that the natural numbers are 1, 2, 3, etc. And we can write them, for example, write 1 as 1 over 1, 2 as 2 over 1 and so on. So what I'm trying to get to is that the set of natural numbers is a subset of the rational numbers and that's why in union Q will be nothing but Q. So since Q is a countable set in union Q will also be countable. So again, we obtain at the same answer, which is that in union Q is a countable set. Okay. 
so this was our problem number one now let us move to the second problem the second problem states that x given by pi over 1 minus pi and we have to check whether x is rational or irrational so we can simply do that by assuming that x is a rational number that is x can be written in form of p over q where both p and q are integers and q is not equal to 0. Now we can rewrite this expression as p minus p pi is equal to q pi which implies p plus q over pi is equal to p or pi is equal to p of p over p plus q now we already know that pi is an irrational number but we can see that here pi is written in terms of p over q let us call it it prime over q prime where p prime is equal to p and q prime is equal to p plus q we have already seen that p belongs to the set of integers so p is an integer and similarly q is also an integer so p plus q will also be an integer now the expression that you obtained here that p is equal pi is equal to p over p plus q implies that an irrational number pi can be written as p prime over q prime where q prime is not equal to 0 so this observation is wrong or contradictory which implies that our first assumption that x is a rational number is not correct so the correct answer will be that x is an irrational number so let me write it clearly here x is an irrational number okay so this is our problem number two and now let us proceed to problem number three this problem states that let a be a rational number then 2 to the power a is always a rational number we can again prove this by giving counter examples so
where we have to give examples where a is a rational number but 2 to the power a is not. One example will be a equal to half which is rational number but for this value of a 2 to the power a will be 2 to the power half or root 2 which is an irrational number. So the statement given here that for a being a rational number 2 to the power a is always a rational number is false. So this statement is false. So this was our problem number 3. Now let us move to problem 4. For this trial run of this uh, session, I am not pausing between the problems but when these videos will be done in a live mode then after each problem is solved I will be waiting for a few moments to check whether if any student have any doubt. So in that way we can delve deeper into the problems but uh, for this video I will just solve the problems. Okay, So let us go to problem number 4 which states that for A belonging to the set of natural numbers and A being a prime then a square plus 2 is always a prime number. Again, we can give counter examples of this statement. For example, for a equal to 2, a square plus 2 will be 4 plus 2 equals 6 which is not prime. Similarly, for a equal to 7, a square plus 2 will be 51, which is also not a prime number. Okay, so the statement given here that a square plus 2 will always be a prime number given a is a prime number is false. So this was our problem number 4. Now let us go to problem number 5. So the problem five states that let p be a prime number and p divides a times b where a and b both are integers then we have to prove p divides a or p divides b or it p can divide both of them so let's make the statement clear and given is p divides a b then we have to prove that p divides a or p divides b now we can prove this in considering two cases 
So let us check the first case where P divides A, then it will automatically imply that P divides AB and so this statement is true but for the second case P does not divide A we have to prove that in that case P will divide B so this can be easily proved first of all P does not divide A and P is a prime that will imply that P and A are co-primes which means the greatest common divisor of P and A will be 1. Now we can prove how P will divide B by considering Bezos identity which states that if x y are co-prime numbers then there exist r and s integers such that Rx plus Sy is equal to 1. So, for our case, we have that P does not divide A, which is for the case 2. That means there will be R and S integers such that rp plus sa will be equal to 1. Now we can multiply both side by 2 and uh, both side by b and we will get rpb plus sab is equal to p. Now the first term here is divisible by p. because it has a p factor and also because both r and b are integers. Similarly, the second term is also divisible by p as p divides a b. So, we can say that p divides rpb plus sab or p divides p so here we have first considered the case that p divides a and then it is half proofed and when p is not dividing a then we have actually proved that p will divide b so the statement given here is actually true okay so this was our problem number five now let us move to problem six Problem 6 states that 
for a function defined in the close interval of a to b to r which is continuous then the function have has to be bounded now what do you mean by bounded function we mean that for all values of x there will be a real number m which is greater than the mod of fx this will be for all x belonging to the domain of this function okay so again to prove whether this statement is true or false let us start by assuming that fx is not bounded above what do you mean by that that means that we will find uh, x1 which is greater than 1 we will similarly find x2 which is greater than 2 we will find uh, x3 which is greater than 3 Similarly, we will find uh, xn which is greater than n. So, this is just another way of writing that for all n, there will be a xn belonging to the closed limit of a comma b. such that if xn will be greater than m sorry this will be if xn greater than n this is because we have only considered the function fx to be not bounded above it might be bounded below but if we follow this argument we can prove that case also so now for all n there exists a xn in the range a to b such that f of xn is greater than n Now, let us look at the sequence of xn. This sequence is actually a bounded sequence in the range a to b. And as this is a bounded sequence, it will have a subsequence which will always converge to a value suppose alpha within the range of the bound so now as the function f is continuous we can say that the sequence of f x s n will also converge to f of alpha but 
previously we assumed that fx is not bounded above but here we are getting that f the sequence of f xn x sn is actually converging to f alpha so our previous assumption that fx is not bounded above is not correct again this is a proof by contradiction and we can similarly proceed by considering that fx is not bounded below and we will again see that this assumption is wrong if you proceed like this. So the statement given here is actually true that the function f will actually be bounded. So this statement is true. Okay, so this was our problem number six. Now let us move to the seventh problem. Okay, so the seventh problem states that for a sequence xn where xn tends to x0 as n tends to infinity then any function f defined in the region a to b We have the property that fxn will also tend to fx0. Now we can easily prove that this statement is actually false by constructing up a function f which is which has a discontinuity at x0. So now let us create a function, for example, say f is equal to x when x is in the range 1 2 3 but x is not equal to 2 when x is equal to 2 f is equal to 0 so if we plot this function will look something like this and at 2 it will be 0. So now let us consider a sequence xn which is given by 2 plus 1 over n. So the sequence goes like 3, 2.5, 2.8, 2.9, 3 3.5, like this and when n tends to infinity xn will tend to 2 but here the function f xn will have a value of 2 when n is tending to infinity or x is going to 2 but f of 2 is actually 0 because we have defined the function is in such a way so you can see that f xn is actually not equal to fx0 so by constructing this function 
we can actually see that this statement is actually false so so this is false and here x is tending to 2 on the positive side okay so this was our problem number 7 and now let us move to problem number 8 okay so let f and g be two functions on r then the domain of let me write it clearly domain of fg is equal to domain of f union domain of g this statement given here is actually wrong and again we will prove it by providing a counter example so let us define the function fx as sin x and the domain of f will be actually it will be actually r and let us also define the function g of x like root over 4 minus x square and the domain of this function will be minus 2 to plus 2. Now what will be the function if g of x this will be nothing but 4 minus x square times sine of x and what will be the domain of fg this will again be from minus 2 to plus 2 and we can see from these two relations and this final relation that this is not correct why because domain of f union domain of g is actually r and domain of fg is from minus 2 to 2 so for this example domain of f union domain of g is not equal to domain of fg so the statement given here is not generally true so also will be the right answer okay so this was our problem number eight now let us move to the ninth problem okay so the problem states that consider a function g given by e to the power fx where f is defined from r to r then we have to prove that range of g is the positive real numbers okay so we can 
solve this. by constructing a function gx as e to the power x and another function fx which is just fx defined from r to r then the composite function g o f of x will actually be given by e to the power f x. Now we know that e to the power x is always greater than 0. For example, e to the power 0 will be 1 and e to the power 2 will be something that it will be square and e to the power something negative will be in the range 0 to 1. So, we can say that e to the power fx will also be greater than 0 when the range of f is actually the set of real numbers. right so e to the power f x will have a range which is set of positive real numbers so, this statement here is actually true. Okay, so this was the ninth problem and we are left with only one problem for this video. So, let us quickly do the last problem which again states that, sorry, which again states that if a function from r to r which is also continuous function then 2 to the power fx is also a continuous function and we can prove this by using the property that composition of two composite functions so so this will be two continuous functions will be also continuous. So, we will use the property that the composition of two continuous functions will be also continuous. So, this is similar to the last problem. We can define a function g of x where it is equal to 2 to the power x in the last case we defined e to the power x here it is 2 to the power x and 
fx is already given as defined from r to r and also continuous so what will be g o f of x this will be nothing but g of f of x and exactly like the previous problem it will be 2 to the power fx now it is already given here that fx is a continuous function and we also know that 2 to the power x is also a continuous function So we can see that two to the power f x it can be written as composition of Two composite functions so again I made the mistakes here so this can be written as composition of two continuous functions so 2 to the power fx will also be continuous so this is the proof and that's why the answer correct answer will be true okay so with this problem the assignments of week zero has been completed so here we solved 10 problems and from the next week we'll solve the assignments one two and three one in each week in live session and also the recorded video will be uploaded in my youtube channel it will be uploaded and also it will be made available to the students from the pmrf support team okay so that's all for today and bye